My name is Olivia Nick-Larsen and I'm an AmeriCorps member serving with Conservation Nebraska's Common Ground Program. Um, the organization aims to improve the stewardship of Nebraska's natural resources by increasing knowledge and concern for important conservation factors facing our state. Uh, to do this, we try to focus on providing educational events like these webinars or before the pandemic set in like in-person events um, and volunteer opportunities and things like that to try and engage uh, community members in working to improve the conservation practices. Um, this afternoon, we have Dr. Eric North from UNL. Dr. North oversees courses in green space and urban forestry management, arboriculture, tree biology, and dendrology. Uh, Dr. North is also involved in professional organizations and community boards, including the International Society of Arboriculture, the Arboriculture Education and Research Academy, and the Lincoln Community Forestry Advisory Board, just to like put a few in there. Um, I just want to remind everyone tuning in that mics are muted, but the chat function is enabled. So if you do have a question, feel free to type it up and we can answer those as we go along or we can wait until the end, just so you know. And then at the end of our presentation, there will also be a quick questionnaire to fill out as well, just for our knowledge to know how well we did. Um, so I will hand it over to Dr. North and we can get this started. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go through the presentation, basically how to uh, get started with tree care. And we're going to start off with a couple, you know, I'm an educator and I teach classes. And so we have to start off with a quiz of some kind. So feel free to use the chat feature. If you want to play along, if, you, if nobody chats, I'll just tell you the answer. That's also what happens in my classes. Um, let's see. So guesses, how many trees are there in the world? Does anybody have a guess? Nobody's guessing? Two, wait, 200? Okay. Billions, okay, billions. We have 200, there's more than 200, thankfully. One trillion, 10 trillion. We got some people that are very optimistic. Three trillion, somebody that's taken my class before. Too many to count. Yes, I mean all types of trees. Yep. So if you actually counted each individual physical tree, how many would you use? Six, six million, I'd guess billions. Well, the answer is actually uh, roughly three trillion trees that came out. This is a a little research paper that came out in uh, 2015 and they actually did count the number of trees and, and did an estimate and it's roughly three trillion uh, trees throughout the entire world. Now obviously that changes a little bit year to year as there are fires or, or other things that happen we plant a few trees here and there um, but three trillion trees that's that's quite an, an amazing number of trees. Uh, how many tree species in the world? So if you think of tree species as being oaks and maples and and dogwoods and things like that. How many roughly do you think tree species there would be in the world? So I got several hundred, 500, 500 species, okay. Uh, 30,000, okay. 1,000. So and a rough estimate of the total number of tree species that exist in the world is about 60,000. That's the estimate if we take all the woody plants. Now that number changes a little bit depending upon exactly how you slice and dice what a species is in terms of tree, but roughly around 60,000 tree species in the entire world. How many tree species would be classified as native to North America, do you think? There are roughly 60,000 in, in the entire world. Twenty thousand five hundred, hundred fifty, about a thousand. So it turns out that depending upon who you read, there's around seven hundred fifty to maybe twelve hundred tree species native to North America, and the number that are classified as native woody plants to Nebraska is usually somewhere around forty to fifty species. Again, de depending upon exactly what you're counting as trees and where you're drawing those, those boundary lines for the ecosystem. So that gives you an idea. Around three trillion trees in the world, around 60 million species of trees in the world, around 750 to 1,000 tree species that are native to North America, and around 40 or 50 that are classified as native to Nebraska. So that, that's a lot. There's a lot of different things to look at and to know. 
Uh, this is just a, a nice little graphic that depicts just some of the benefits. So as Olivia mentioned, I teach classes in arboriculture and urban forestry. So I think a lot about trees that live in, in our cities and, and that the, what they provide for us. And I just really like this graphic. This shows a lot more uh, benefits than most people tend to think about. Everything, the things that people don't always think about are trees increasing your property value and improving your mental health. Really important, obviously, in a time like now where most of us are social distancing or we feel maybe a little more isolated. If you can look out a window or go for a walk and you see trees around or other nature, it really does help. And so just keep that in mind. We go through, generally speaking, in order for trees to provide these great benefits, the bigger trees equal more benefits. So the bigger the tree, the better off we are in terms of the benefits that they provide and also the longer they live. So just a great big tree, if it happened to grow really fast and, and get big right away, that's great, it offers some benefits, but having those trees last for a really long time. Now this happens to be a picture of a bur oak, which is native to Nebraska. And this species can live up to 250 or more, 300 years. Um, so oaks have, have a good long lifespan. And the longer we can keep those trees alive, the more benefits that they provide. So this is, I'm a scientist, and so I always like to present a little bit of the science. This is a paper that came out, a scientific journal article that came out in 2018. And I bring it up just so that we kind of put it into context why we should care about tree care and why some of the things that I am going to talk about tonight are, are important to think about in a broad context. So Dave Nowak and Eric Greenfield are researchers at the US Forest Service, and they do a great job. And every time they put out a paper, it's sort of depressing to read. There's a decline in canopy cover. And if you look at this map of the United States, the darker the state color, the more canopy cover that we're losing. And this is canopy cover, not, not, corn, not uh, forests that uh, turn into cornfields or something like that. Um, typically, this canopy cover is decreasing just in our urban areas. So it, I see a guess here that, you know, the increase in cropland, well, that might be true with some of our natural forests. This paper is only addressing the trees that are in our cities and, and in our towns. And so it turns out that Nebraska is losing our tree cover in our cities at about the third highest rate in the entire country. So here in Nebraska, the Arbor Day State, where Arbor Day Foundation is, really we're, we've started to see a decline, a pretty significant decline in terms of our canopy cover in our cities and towns. And the guess as to where that is, people always say, oh, it's maybe development, it's more houses, it's uh, cropland occasionally, but since we're dealing with just cities, it turns out when they looked at this paper, they looked at the years from 2009 to 2014 to assess canopy decline, and they showed that whatever, what was a tree in 2009, in 2014, was now grass. So it looks like that as trees get removed, we're simply maybe not replanting them or we replant them, but they're not, they're not living for a long enough uh, uh, period of time. Um, so yeah, somebody typed in not replacing trees. I like to, to, to uh, brings up a good point. I like to say that you cannot replace a tree. So a large mature tree, a great big old bur oak, you can't replace that. You can replant, but you're gonna replant a much smaller tree. And so really important to think about large old trees can't be replaced. They can only replant and then you wait another 200 years until it gets to that size again. So just something to keep in mind. And this clearly didn't happen overnight. It wasn't like there was one storm that took, took out all the trees. This is sort of a trend showing a, a decrease over a longer period of time. Um, so development practices. So we're gonna look at some of the reasons that cause this. There are development practices. Here we see that somebody's getting some work done here and this tree has been buried, right? Nothing likes to be buried uh, alive, <laughs> including our trees. And if you pile this much soil, while the tree itself doesn't die right away, and that's, that's often confusing for folks, is that trees can take five, 10, 15 years of, of damage before they actually succumb and die. And so putting this much soil over the root space actually decreases the amount of soil oxygen and soil moisture that's there, which causes a problem for long-term tree growth. So this tree might decline slowly over a number of years. And it, obviously this is preventable. You just stack the soil somewhere else. Um, poor design, this happens. This is actually, I was out uh, 
uh, walking around the neighborhood and I saw this. These are eastern white pines planted essentially right underneath this power line. Well, clearly that's not going to, um, that's not gonna last a long time because that, that tree is gonna grow into the power line. They're gonna have to be pruned. And oftentimes those pruning cuts for power lines are not the best. I'm sure some of you have seen that. And so that, that, that's an issue um, that we need to think about. We have some poor installation practices. People oftentimes uh, install trees and then they forget to remove some of the, the staking material. And you can see on the picture on the right there that this material is actually now cut into that branch that can cause a problem. The picture where you're seeing the roots at the base, that's actually um, uh, what we call stem girdling roots. Those are something that can be prevented at time of planting. And I, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit as to how to identify and correct those. But where the root touches the trunk, um, that can cause a problem where it actually starts to choke the tree in such a way that it can't uptake uh, moisture and nutrients. So that's a problem. And obviously completely preventable. We can correct these things as we plant these trees in our landscapes. And of course we have pests and pathogens. Emerald ash borer is the current one. It was discovered in the United States in 2002, discovered in Nebraska, I believe in Omaha in 2016. It's now been found elsewhere throughout Nebraska and this is a little pest. It's not the actual flying adult, right? It's never the adults that cause the problem. It's always the kids. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the little larva is actually eating through the uh, cambium layer of, of the tree and that, that causes a significant problem. So that's what we're actually looking at. And this isn't the first one. If you look back in a uh, hundred years ago, a little more than a hundred years ago, 1905, you can see that we had um, all sorts of diseases that were coming in, uh, chestnut blight, and then we had Dutch elm disease that came in in the 1930s and probably hit through Nebraska in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and we still see some. Uh, it's only a matter of time, right, for other insects. Sorry, this is a little more depressing than I wanted to get into, but this, there's other insects, and a lot of these that are already in the country and are moving from the East Coast to the West are Asian longhorn beetle, spotted lanternfly, there's some other things that the Nebraska Forest Service, for those of you that follow um, the Nebraska Forest Service, or get some of their emails, they've got some other things that are coming out. And so um, kind of an issue there, and you wanna make sure that uh, we diversify our planting so that uh, the next pest that comes through doesn't cause as large of an impact. And that gets to this. So <clears throat> uh, monocultured landscapes, meaning we plant all the same tree along a street, which happens quite a bit, uh, that can cause really expensive management problems, especially if you have ash. And there's a, uh, th I see a couple of questions coming in. Some of them I'll get to near the end, um, but there's one that came in that pertained to emerald ash borer. What, what trees do emerald ash borer attacks? Emerald ash borer attacks any tree in, in the ash genus. Um, for those of you that are scientifically inclined, that's fraxinus. So those would be green ash, white ash, blue ash, um, uh, orange ash. These are all native, uh, North American native ash. The common ones here in Nebraska would be green ash and white ash. If you have something like mountain ash, that's not a true ash. And so EAB does not, does not impact that. So if you had a street that was lined completely with, with ash trees, right now that costs a lot to remove that entire street, uh, all of the trees on there. And so uh, by diversifying the planting, by having maybe an ash and a maple and an oak and a coffee tree and maybe a ginkgo or something like that, um, it means that when a pest comes through, it won't, will likely only impact one of those trees and not all of them, uh, just as something to consider. So this got me thinking, your toaster has a manual. I just bought a toaster recently and it actually came with a manual. I have no idea why. You just push the button down and it, it, it even has a cancel button in place the last minute you decide you don't want toast for some reason. Uh, and I started thinking, you know, it's, trees are much, much more complicated than toasters. And some folks at the US Forest Service agreed. And so they actually came out uh, with a manual for a tree. So why wouldn't your tree have a manual, right? It's really complicated. They live for hundreds of years. Somebody uh, had a comment earlier that, you know, people might be afraid of large trees because the tree could fall and damage your house. If we maintain trees, they're never 100% safe, just like nothing in this world is 100% safe. But if we know how to maintain them properly, we can reduce 
the risk of those trees. And so some of what we're going to talk about now is how we can do things right when, when a tree is young to reduce the possibility of failures and risk in the future. So who needs a manual right here? There's kids planting a tree. Most of you have probably heard the, the saying, green side up, that's about all you need to know. If you have a willow, you can just kind of toss it near a hole, and as long as it lands, it'll probably sprout, because that's what willows do. But it can be a little more complicated if we want to do it well, and we want to do it right, so that the tree lasts for a long time and provides the benefits that we're interested in, right? You can see these trees, they were small when they were planted, but clearly, these are not great spaces for trees, and one would argue that there's not a lot of benefit that some of these trees are actually providing. The one on the the left there, the big power lines going right through it, and the, the other one, it's basically crooked and bent over, and so this, these trees are more of a problem than they are benefit, and so we don't always think about when we first plant a tree, because it looks like it'll fit anywhere, that we need to cons be concerned with how big will that tree get, and will it fit in that space long term, right? What could possibly go wrong? It's just planting a tree, right? What am I saying? Well, here's a, a tree, you can see the stump that's left over, and uh, what happened is this tree uh, was not planted properly. It lasted, you can see it's a pretty good sized stump, so it lasted quite a while before that problem uh, arose uh, to a, a significant enough level that it caused damage when the tree fell. Luckily, no one was hurt in that. Uh, here's another one, this is a researcher that I had with me one year, we we're looking at storm damage, and, and this was a tree, this was actually a giant elm that had been there for, we cutting into it and looking at it and we think it was been on the street for about 70 or 80 years. And uh, Rachel, my research assistant there, she's about five feet, five inches tall, so you can get a sense of how large those cement panels are. And those were sidewalk panels. And what we were able to determine is that when they put in the new sidewalk, they cut all the tree roots. And then a storm came in. And you can see trees clearly standing in the background on both of these streets. It was the same storm. And we realized that any trees that had their roots cut to replace sidewalks uh, essentially fell over in the storm at a much higher rate than any of the other trees. Um, so thinking about how we interact with trees is really important. If you cut the roots and the tree doesn't immediately fall over, most people think that's oh, probably fine. But uh, even five years in the, into the future, that can cause significant problems, which is what we found in this or planting, this could be a big problem. Here you see, um, see if I can do this here. Can you see this laser pointer, Olivia? Yeah, I can see it. So right here, this is a notebook. We can see this line. This is how deep the tree was planted. And notice that it, it kind of goes down almost like the tip of a pencil. And you see this discolored here. This is a uh, stem girdling root that hadn't been corrected at time of planting and a big enough storm. So it basically compressed that stem tissue and made it smaller and smaller. And then big basswood like that, the top just caught the wind and it tipped over. And so this can all be corrected at time of planting so that this doesn't happen in the future, right? Here's another tree. This is clearly what some folks are afraid of, big trees damaging their homes. Uh, I rarely see large trees damaging homes I, I have an enormous tree out front, it's survived many storms, but we make sure that it's maintained and pruned properly and anything that might cause damage, make sure that we take care of right away so that we minimize any, any possibility or the, or the probability of, of failure. All right, this is a trained arborist. Look at this, look at this guy. He's got a helmet on, he's got safety glasses, he's got you know ropes and he's got gear, it looks professional. This is the type of person you want working on your tree. Uh, this, I don't know what this guy is doing. This was sent to me actually by a student. <laughs> she sent it to me as something that happened one morning as she was on her way to class. She said, look at this picture, you know, here there's no safety equipment. There's just, he's kind of sitting there. He's not really even tied in. He's cutting a branch directly above his head. These are not good pruning cuts, right? You wouldn't want this tree around after this individual got done cutting it. And hopefully the individual actually made it out of the tree safely. And so what, what we really want to focus on is if you hire people for tree care work, that you're hiring a trained arborist that really, really knows what they're doing to keep you safe, to keep the tree safe, and to keep whoever might buy the property or, or use that property in the future, uh, that that tree can be, can, can, can help to reduce some of that, that risk. 
Uh, so here's the tree owner manual, uh, tree owners manual. This was produced by the US Forest Service. So it's, I would say it's free, but let's be honest, your tax dollars paid for it. So it's there for you to use, it's publicly available. Uh, I link to it on trees.unl.edu. Uh, uh, if you go under, there's a community tab, you can download this. And they just, uh, if you do a Google search, there's now a version in Spanish as well. So if, if that's of interest to you, and we're gonna go through basically uh, some of the information that's in this manual. And this is really designed for people uh, doing projects with volunteers or homeowners that really wanna make sure that you're planting the tree properly and that you're caring for at least the first initial few years uh, so that the tree can last a long time and provide great benefits. Uh, planting trees, the general rule of thumb is the smaller you can get a tree to plant it, the better off you are. And I usually explain this to people like, you know, if you're trying to, to uh, train a dog and, and you have a, an old dog that's never been trained how to sit or how to be on a leash and you start when the dog is, is much older, you can still do it, but it's a lot harder. It takes a lot more time. If you start with a puppy and you train the puppy, you know, not to poop in the house and you train the puppy how to uh, sit and stay, then you have a well-trained uh, dog and adult dog. And so that, that's really helpful. And so the same, similar with trees. If we put them in the ground and get them going really well at the very beginning, they're much better mature trees. If we put them in kind of sloppy or we're not really paying attention, uh, that can cause trees that are more problematic when they get older. Uh, the, the most common uh, type of tree is this containerized tree. Bald and burlap, those are much bigger, usually much more expensive than containerized trees are sort of in the middle ground. And bare root, you can typically only get in the springtime. And those, you can see the root system, you see everything you get, there's nothing hidden. And they're, they can be fairly easy to work with, but they're not always uh, available. Uh, step one, when you first buy your tree, you have to move it. And it's important to remember your tree is not a two by four, at least not yet. And so you have to protect the trunk as you move it along. Any scrape or damage you do to the trunk can have long, longer term consequences. And so you want to make sure that you're handling it. Uh, you want to remove any of the packing material that comes through. Uh, so any of the tags, twine, uh, wrap that's around there, once you get it to where, once you get it placed to where you're going to put it in the hole, remove all of that. Uh, all of that packing material that can cause damage. I've seen trees where even just this, this tag on the tree was left on, but it was tied around the trunk. And then uh, the tree grew really well. They watered it, the tree grew, got a little bit bigger. And the, where the tag was actually caused some girdling in the trunk itself. And a windstorm came over and then snapped that tree off. And then they had to replace the tree. So you wanna make sure, especially young trees can grow pretty quick make sure that you are moving that pack. Uh, there was an old saying or an old way of doing things where people would plant a tree and then they'd, they'd try to remove a bunch of the branches on top so that they could balance the root loss with the, the top of the tree. And turns out we don't need to do that. In fact, that's not a great practice. If you, the trees get the majority of their food from the carbon dioxide in the air. And if you remove the branches, they don't have much food. And so you wanna keep as many of the branches on as you can, and then just make sure you're maintaining water. Here, basically the steps are, if it's a branch is broken, prune that off. You have a clearly dead branch, you wanna prune that off. And if you have two leaders, or these two um, areas of the trunk where they're separating off, and I'll show a couple of pictures of that later, and we'll kind of come back to this, but you'd wanna prune off one of those so you have one nice, straight, tall, central leader or trunk. Um, to develop good structure for a long-term benefit of your tree. Right? This is a picture of what could have been prevented if at planting time, you can see here, this, this would have been one trunk, uh, two, three, and then four in the back. Um, and this probably came out a little bit later and same with this one, but these uh, branches or trunks, if, if they had been pruned back, um, this would not have happened in the storm. Here we see this dark discoloration here. This is where the, that other side of the trunk was actually pressed up against. We call that included bark, where bark gets included there. And, and so when enough weight of storms gets put on that branch, it causes it to tear out and pull away very, very easily. So we wanna look for those and prune those off. If you prune it when you first plant it, you can do it with little hand pruners and just snip and it's done. If you wait till it's this size, you clearly would have to hire somebody and be more expensive. And so we could have prevented this early on. 
how young is too young to plant a, a viable tree? Well, the, in nature, the trees are planted as seeds, so that works. Um, I like to plant a lot of things by a seed. Um, if you do grow from seed and it's growing in a pot, I usually like to let them sit at least until the end of the season and then plant it out in the fall. So you can really plant a tree uh, at, at, any, at any point. I've even taken trees out of my yard that have been planted by squirrels or birds and just moved them to a better location. And as long as you try to get the bulk of the roots and you keep the soil intact, so you're not breaking roots, and then you make sure you keep it well watered, uh, it should be fine. Um, so here you wanna find the first main root system. So here you can see a picture of a bald and burlap uh, tree. And you can see that they're kind of showing off some, um, where you snip away the wire. And people will say, oh, the wire causes damage, the burlap causes damage. It turns out that when we look at the research, that probably it doesn't cause too much damage. The wire doesn't break down over time. We've dug wire out of holes that have been there for 20 years, and it's still pretty well intact. Burlap will tend to degrade over time, not in all situations, but it can, or mostly will. The biggest problem, though, is that in, when it's in this ball and burlap here, we don't know where the first root comes out. And we can assume, I've dug out maybe a few hundred trees we've looked at in pots and in, and in root balls. And on, on average, they're somewhere between three and 14 inches too deep in the root ball. And so we need to make sure that those roots, they don't, roots don't want to be sunk far down. They want to be, at least those first roots want to be within an inch or so of the soil surface because they need enough oxygen and moisture. And if they don't have that, it can cause girdling of the trunk and it can cause instability actually in the tree. So here they're cutting away that first and they're basically digging down to find those first roots. If you have a containerized tree, they're, here they're demonstrating using a little screwdriver to poke around so you find that first root and then you can measure out how deep it was and then you cut off that first layer of soil to basically help uh, make sure that you're exposing the root system and planting the tree at the proper depth. Here's a picture I took of a tree that was in a natural setting, and we can see that the roots are mostly flat. <laughs> um, they don't tend to go very deep. In most situations, we'll see in the upper uh, two to three feet of soil is, is where the bulk of the roots are. That's not to say that you can't have some that are deeper. That clearly does happen. Um, so something to think about, but most of these roots, especially the ones that are absorbing water and nutrients, are, are within the upper two to three feet of the soil. Uh, stem girdling roots planted too deep. This picture here with the screwdriver, here's the, the depth that it was planted at. You can see the, the discoloration of the bark, and then this is where it was in the pot, and the tree actually developed a second root system. We call that an adventitious root system. It's a second root system. Uh, because those roots were too deep in the pot, they couldn't get enough oxygen, they couldn't get enough uh, moisture, and so they actually grew a, a second layer of roots. And here, down at the end, this is where the, they were sitting on the bottom of the pot, and there was a ton of moisture there, and so they also, the original root system developed quite well. If you leave it like this and you plant it in, here you can see one that's been planted, and this root is actually just starting, it's encircling the tree, and just starting to girdle the tree. This can be corrected. It's very expensive and, and the success rate for large trees is a little bit lower, as you can imagine. So it's easier to correct when you first plant it. And as long as you can keep it watered, it's pretty good. What you'd have to do is come in here with an air tool um, and you blow away all the soil and then you have to prune these out, just like you were pruning a branch and then put soil back on top of it and then uh, make sure you keep it well watered but can be expensive and, and a little riskier. Uh, here you can see, whenever you see a tree, if it goes down and you don't see a nice flare, here we see a flat surface and the root is just coming up. You can see that just below the surface, the root is actually pushing into the stem and causing that uh, to sink in a little bit and that can cut off the oxygen and moisture and, and the nutrients that flow up. This might live like this for several years, but it can create a weak spot and potential for decay, which would mean that that tree is more likely to fall under winds or normal conditions. Right here you see a tree, lack of flare. Notice it just kind of goes down, it looks almost like a telephone pole shoved into the ground, guaranteed the tree was planted too deep. And here, this one, you can see a little bit of that discolored uh, bark there. That's where the root was wrapped around it, and just below that was where some rot got in because that tree was planted too deep and the roots basically strangled the tree. And this was just a sort of a typical storm 
um, not, nothing, it wasn't a tornado or anything, just normal kind of storm and it twisted this tree out of the base. So planting too deep can cause tree instability, but it might take a few years. Right? So correcting stem girdling roots, if we're looking at just the containerized tree, you find where the first root is, you measure down, you remove that top layer of soil. So here's two pots. Uh, if you want to type in what you think you see are the differences, um, give people a second if you want to participate in that. So I've got one that says root bound on the right. Yep, so this one here, a little bit of root bound. You see lots of roots at the, at the outside and they're actually starting to circle around. Um, one of the other things you might have noticed Yep, another one with, with root bound. Here, look, at, notice the difference in the pot. So this pot is solid sided. There's just a couple of little weeping holes here at the bottom. So these are flipped upside down so the tree would sit on top of it. Uh, and this solid sided pot, well, if a root hits the edge of a pot, it just turns and goes around. The one on the right, the container here, um, this container has these little holes in it and these little ridges. And notice as the roots hit those airspace, the, the root actually will die back. If it has too much oxygen, that's a problem. And that helps to reduce the amount of encircling wrapped around. So that's, that's a big difference, just in the pot. If you go to a nursery that uses these types of pots, and there are a few other pots that are like this that help develop better root systems, it's a higher quality tree. If it's all solid sided, that can produce a root problems. They can be corrected. So uh, no need to throw out the tree or anything, but the, you, if you correct it at time of planting, uh, you can have a tree that's for a long period of time. So how do we correct it? So here's the tree that's, that's pot bound. Several of you mentioned that. This is an old pruning saw. Always use an old pruning saw. It's cutting through soil uh, is rough on the blades. Notice too that the roots, there aren't any in this top layer. The tree was pushed down and so the roots are just naturally gonna be a little bit lower and it takes a while for them to develop off the stem. So right away we can tell that that's probably planted too deep. So here I fixed it and notice that I essentially what I did is I box cut this. So I cut a straight line here, a straight line here, here, and here to make a box around that circle. That way none of the roots were wrapping around anymore. Just teasing the roots out has been shown in, with woody plants to not work particularly well because those roots will, can actually slide back into, once a tree root becomes woody, it has a tendency to want to curve back in the direction it was. Anybody that's hiked in the woods knows that is true because if you've hiked through and, and you move a branch out of the way, if you just let it go, it slaps the person behind you. Well, same thing with woody roots. If you bend them out and then you let them go, they have a tendency to just flip back. So the best thing is to cut those. Now we've removed some roots, so we need to make sure that we keep it well watered because that would create water stress. Notice too that I've now got a taller tree. I mean, I think it's taller by about three inches. So I increased the height of my tree and it didn't have to pay any extra for it, it was just taller by developing and finding where those first roots come out. And now we can plant this tree at the proper depth. Uh, these gentlemen, this is a picture from 1909. Um, it's a friend of mine that works at the University of Minnesota. He sent me this historic photograph this was an elm. The way they used to do elms was just go out in the forest, rip them out, and then they cut off everything on the top because they cut off everything on the bottom and they threw them in a hole. And look at these gentlemen. I, I mean, I've got to believe they're three feet in this hole, way too deep. Um, this is part of the reason people love to plant elms because they would take this kind of abuse and keep, keep growing. Um, we've learned a lot since then. So don't do this. This is far too deep uh, to plant. The main steps, uh, bare root, it's very easy. You, you can see all the roots. So you just measure the height from right where that first root comes out to the, where the bottom of the roots are. That's how deep you dig the hole. So you need to find that first root uh, coming off the trunk and then measure down so you know the height, how deep to dig the hole. So we do that with all of them, bare root, containerized, and ball and burlap, so we can really figure out the depth. What size should it be in terms of width? Well, the, it, what they use in the manual is two to three uh, times the root ball, and that's pretty reasonable. I will tell you that um, I've planted trees in roughly the same size hole as the pot, and they've done just fine. The depth is the most important part. 
uh, the bigger you can make the hole and, and loosen up the soil, that all gives the tree a little bit better chance to have the roots go out and explore the soil. But depth is, is the single most important part in terms of hole size. As long as it's big enough to fit the root ball in it, that's usually one. Uh, corrected roots, right? Here you can see this tree, bigger tree. Here's the original soil line that it was in the bald and burlap. They corrected it. You can now see a flare on the trunk, just a little bit of a flare. And so, and you can see that that was probably, I would guess, four or five inches too deep. And they corrected it before digging the hole and before planting. And that's what you want to see, right? Root at the surface. If you've ever walked through the woods or walked through a wooded area, and if you're not looking down, you'll trip over a bunch of tree roots. They're right there. And that's where they want to be naturally to, to produce large, mature, uh, healthier trees. So right at the surface, and you should see this flare, right? Once you do all this, don't then put a plastic thing around it. This is bad. <laughs> this is essentially creating a big pot for the tree to sit in. And you can see that the roots are bound up in the space. Uh, trees like this have lower stability, so they're more likely to fall in storms. And they're more likely, if you look at the canopy, to be very, very sparse at the top and have sickly kinds of leaves as they come in. Even if you take that off, here's one. This is just, again, in my walks around the neighborhood. Um, here, this clearly had some sort of above ground container put in. You can see the roots hit that container and they, they stayed there. Some maybe went deep, but if it's, there's not enough oxygen and moisture below, that can cause a problem for the tree roots. So they won't explore too deep. I hear this sometimes, you can't plant trees where a previous one was growing. Here's a, a stump, right? That's, that's nonsense. Um, trees will grow right on top of other trees if given the opportunity in the right circumstances. This is a picture from uh, a forest I was hiking through in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Um, <clears throat> so you can basically uh, plant trees wherever. Now, if you have a tree, a stump in your yard, I recommend getting that stump ground and then maybe take some of that, the grindings and use those elsewhere in your garden. If you can bring a little extra soil in, uh, that, that will help uh, just make sure that the, the tree does well in terms of nutrients, but you can plant them basically right on top. Um, yeah, there's a, a question or a comment here that sometimes people put these retaining walls around, around trees. And yeah, I really recommend against that if you can avoid it. You wanna make sure you're giving the tree a nice big uh, space for its roots. How much mulch? What, what color? People get really excited about what color mulch. You can use whatever color you want. Um, most of the mulches that are sold commercially, what they use to color them are not toxic to the plant. Uh, this is too deep. This is what we call volcano mulching. Don't do that. Especially if you just got the roots put at the right depth and, you, and then you bury them too deep again, that's not great. You don't want to do that. I prefer organic mulches. So wood wood chips, things like that. It, it helps to break down over time. It adds a little bit of organic material to the soil, right? Staking, you can certainly stake your tree uh, so that it doesn't blow over, but trees, like people, need movement in order to develop strength. So if you sat in a chair for 15 years and then somebody said, okay, we're gonna take your chair away now, go, go run a 5K or something, uh, you probably wouldn't be able to do it. You might not even be able to stand, honestly. And trees also need to blow and move in the wind. As a tree moves, they're not stupid. They have figured out that over time, if a tree moves and it's blowing, it'll actually develop more wood so that it can stay up straight and tall. And by staking things, we wanna stake things really loosely and really only for a season, maybe two if you really have to, uh, but you want the tree to be able to move around. The stakes should just prevent it from completely falling over but the tree should still be able to sway back and forth, developing good wood structure. If you leave these on too long, which clearly has been done here, they will cut in, uh, or they can cut into the actual trunk, and that can cause a lot of problems that, that you don't want to see. This can actually kill the tree in some cases, or it might just cause rot and decay in this branch, which may break out, and, and then you may have to remove the tree. Uh, here's my neighbor from, from a place I lived at. He, I looked out my window. I, I was it's a side of the house I didn't look on very often. And he had taken this wire and he jammed it over it. And then he put his sock, I guess, to help protect the tree. And guesses as to how long that wire was in there? You can see it's already cut in. How long, any, any guesses as to how long that was there before I noticed it? I got one that says five years. 
Uh, strangely enough, this is a fairly young tree and I saw this in the spring, 14, I'm gonna assume 14 years, uh, one year. Uh, this was actually only there for two weeks. Uh, tree, young trees in the springtime can grow very quickly and put on a lot of wood. And because of where this was and how tight he had pulled it, um, it caused some, some damage. And so I pruned off some of the branches and we removed it. And it turned out that this tree was leaning, not because it was compromised, but because there was another tree. So the, the tree was leaning this way. There was another tree right here and it was shading out uh, that, that tree. And so the tree was leaning to get access to sunlight. You can't pull a tree straight if it's leaning to get sunlight. It will always go back into trying to get more sunlight because that's what it will need. And so we removed the tree that was causing shade on this tree, pruned off the branches, and we, we see the indentation there. This is one year later. And you can see that the wound here from the pruning is starting to seal over nicely. You still see a little bit of the where the, the wire was. And what's really interesting about this, if you don't see it right away, is that it's thicker on top than it is on the bottom. That's because as the tree is photosynthesizing from its leaves, they're collecting all the carbon and making sugars. And those sugars were flowing down the stem and they hit this area that had been compressed or girdled. And then they built up there because they, the, the uh, phloem or the tubes essentially that carry that were too narrow to get much of the sugar down. Got some down, um, but caused a buildup. Now this tree is young enough, would recover, should be no problem. Uh, so there's a question about zippered bags at the bottom of trees. What's the purpose of the zipper bag? Um, they've been there for a couple of years. Usually in newly planted trees or sometimes newly planted trees in some cities, they'll put these green bags with a little zipper on them and those are there so you can insert a hose and um, the hose will fill up the bag with usually about 20 gallons of water and it's got little perforations on the bottom and that will help to slowly water the tree. So ideally those are left on uh, for a growing season, taken off at the end of the growing season, put back on at the beginning of the next growing season. And it's a way you can fill it up basically once a week. Um, there's a question here about if a tree was staked and left, can that wound eventually heal? Uh, important to note that trees don't heal from, from anything. The wound is there for the life of the tree. What it will do or can do is grow over uh, that, that whatever that wound was. But that wound, like this pruning wound is there for the life of the tree. Eventually it grows new bark over it. What that means though is that any place we've wounded a tree, um, there's the potential for decay uh, to get in there. And that decay could be in that tree for the rest of the life for the tree. Anybody that's worked with wood or, or you see knots in trees you, and you see weird little structures in them, you, you know that trees just grow around it. They don't actually heal quickly. So pruning, defects uh, dead and minimal and you wanna prune when young. When young, the branches are lightweight, there's less problem you're gonna hurt yourself, it's easier to get at, and so, but we wanna focus on the, the pruning. How young, um, I, newly planted trees, I, I usually only prune off the stuff that, that is defected or dead, or if we've got like here two, two liters, I might prune one of those off, and you can do that right away. Then some of the young trees on maples, they grow so fast, I might prune a young maple that was recently planted every year or two um, and to develop good structure. Once good structure is there, then, then I leave it alone for a few years to let it. You wanna evaluate the tree. Everybody asks me, when should I prune? Nobody asks, why should I prune? <laughs> or what should I be looking at? And here you can see this gentleman is looking at this tree and you can see a branch here or kind of a trunk here and a trunk here. Um, and ideally you'd remove one of those two because it's forking really low and so you'd have one nice straight tall so it doesn't branch so low and that can help improve the stability. You don't have to prune trees when they're dormant. Um, if that were true then none of the arborists, none of the urban foresters that are pruning, they, they'd all only work for about two or three months in the winter but they work all year round so, so you can prune whenever the big thing to be careful of is if there's a particular disease that can cause a problem with a tree. So for our apples, we have apple scab, we have um, 
fire blight and some disease concerns, you want to prune when it's outside of that disease time. So for some trees, you might prune when it's dormant uh, to make sure you're, you're minimizing the risk of disease. But for a lot of trees, you can prune them uh, whenever you'd like. Um, here's a defect that could have been pruned off. Again, this was two trunks coming up about the same size. And we can see that there was what we call included bark. You can prune that off and that really helps, would have helped. Now this tree, because it's in front of, on a, on a street, needs to be removed because there's potential for A to get in there. And so um, you wanna be really careful about that. Uh, co-dominant leaders, these are two trunks. This is co-dominant, they're about the same size. Notice that this bark has this rolled in texture. Uh, that means that there's no wood to wood connection. That means it's bark to bark which means that can be pulled apart under the right scenario. Here's one that uh, had fallen out and there's a little bit closer picture. That's my hat so you can get a sense of the size. Um, all of this is bark that was included in that connection, which means it's a little bit weaker. And the tree if it gets loaded. This happened to be an October snowstorm loaded with a lot of snow and it caused the branch to fall and tear. Ooh, yeah, go ahead and, and think about that for a sec. And I'm gonna answer a question from uh, someone. I have trees with plastic barriers and borders around the tree, should they be removed? Um, if, the, if the plastic is, is right around and restricting its root system, I would say, I, I would personally remove that. Um, it, that way the roots can make sure that they're exploring and developing properly and it's not cutting off or, or sort of reburying them in the yard in a bigger pot. If you have any plastic that's up against the trunk, sometimes they come with that. You want to make sure that you remove that plastic as well. So any guesses as to, so if we look at this, the tree is five years old. This branch is about three feet off the ground. It grows at a rate of uh, one foot per year. How high off the ground would it be? Yeah, I have a guess. One guess. Some smart people. Okay, good. So I have anywhere from three feet to about 18 feet. Um, the, the correct answer is three feet. Branches do not grow up. Trees don't grow out from the, from the bottom. Yep, we're one with the same height. Trees don't grow up from the bottom. They actually grow out from the very ends of the branches. So wherever that bud is, is where the new branch starts from. And so a, a branch that's three feet off the ground will always be three feet off the ground. Um, for those of you that have had a tree swing, you know this intrinsically, right? Because if you put the tree swing in, it's not like after five years, you need a ladder to get into the, to the swing. You can always access the swing the same. And so those branches will stay at that same height. Um, so if you have a branch that's coming out, it's, it's too low and you wanna be able to mow under it or walk under it, it's a good idea to prune that off uh, when it's smaller, does less uh, wounding to the tree and will recover a bit faster. And that, that branch is not going to move up. But don't feel bad if you didn't quite get that right. It's a really common misconception because we have this idea that trees are growing up out of the ground, but really they're growing out from their ends. And so just something to keep in mind. Uh, if you want to do some pruning, we rec I recommend, especially on the smaller branches, using the three cut method. So cut one, you cut under and you cut just, you don't go all the way through. You cut under just a little bit. And then cut two, you start at the top and you go all the way through. Now, oftentimes you'll get to about midway or three quarters of the way through and the branch will fall off. The reason we make this undercut here is that especially in the spring, if a branch has a lot of weight as you're cutting it, it'll start to break off before you finish the cut. And that can peel the bark all the way down in, into the trunk, which can cause some damage to the trunk. And it's really hard since trees don't heal they have to grow over the, the damage on the trunk, and the trunk is where the tree might snap off. So we want to make sure that we prevent that. Once you've cut all the way through two, and like I said, you get about half to three quarters of the way, and if it's heavy enough, it'll snap off right where the hits the first cut that you made. And then you can come back, and now you just have this little stub, which doesn't weigh very much. And so now you can make a nice cut right through. And notice that this cut is perpendicular or at a right angle to the branch. It's not up and down and parallel to the trunk. We wanna make sure we leave just a little bit there um, because we don't wanna ever cut into the trunk because again, that would be wounding the trunk and that would cause some potential structural problems in the trunk. 
you're trying to prune right outside. Here's a swollen area. You'd prune right outside this branch collar. The branch collar is a mix of both branch wood and trunk wood. And if we prune just to the outside of that, we're never wounding the trunk itself. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. We call that natural target pruning. And if you look at the way trees grow in nature, if a branch dies off, they tend to die off right at that, that collar area. And if you, you know you've pruned it reasonably well, if in a few years you see this, we call this callus wood or wound wood tissue. If it's fairly circular and fairly even, you know that you did a good job cutting it. If it's really oval shaped or it's really thick in one spot and none of it is growing on another spot, it, you could probably do better the next time. Let's just say it like that. Uh, so some basic wound response. Here's a pruning wound. Remember, unlike uh, people, plants don't heal. The injury remains for the life of the tree. The larger the wound, the bigger the potential problem. Okay, so if we can prune small branches when trees are younger and maintain good structure, just like training a puppy, right? Training and, and getting a good structure in a tree when it's young can, can lead to a, a potentially less hazardous tree and a, and a more beneficial tree. Um, Trees compartmentalize, which means that inside they actually uh, put in different chemicals to try and protect itself. And if we know how to prune properly, we can aid the tree in, in how it responds to wounds. So the callus wood or wound wood formation, you can see that this happens. This is only one year later. And so it doesn't always take that long for a tree to start to grow over. And the smaller the wound, clearly the, the, the sooner that that wound will close up. Here you can see, this is a branch that had died off naturally. This was actually rescued from my firewood pile because I thought it looked cool. But you can see a branch broke off naturally and look, it's just starting to develop that wound wood, but not up here where it broke off. It develops it back here, right next to where there's trunk tissue. So here's trunk wood coming in. We see it swooping up and then we can see some of the branch wood. And notice that the branch is starting to decay a little bit is contained completely within the wood of the branch and isn't getting into the wood of the trunk. So by pruning properly, we can make sure that the, any decay stays in as small a pocket as possible. And that's due to the way trees compartmentalize or seal off or wall off potential decay and diseases. So if we work the biology of the tree, we can make nice, nice pruning cuts that reduce the potential damage to it. So the basic goal is we want fewer of this. Let's look at this tree here. These are basswoods or lindens, you might be familiar with them. They should, be, they should be nice, thick like this. Look at this one. If we looked close to the ground, we'd see that it has stem girdling roots. And this one here, we can see that it fell and it broke off. Usually if they break off and don't pull up a bunch of soil with them, it had stem girdling roots. And that's completely preventable uh, in our trees and our landscape if we know what we're doing when we first Right, we want more of this. Nice big, look at these nice big oaks, really nice. Um, this is an old elm line street. We want these big old trees that are well cared for so we don't have to be as concerned about them uh, falling down in storms. Trees, you know, the oldest living tree is, is around 5,000 years old and, and it's survived lots of storms. And, and some of the redwoods in California are two and 3,000 years old and have clearly survived lots well-maintained trees in our communities might not last 5,000 years, although it would be great if they did, but we could certainly get them to 100 years or, or more uh, well-maintained and cared for. Um, for those of you, if there's any, anybody that's interested in studying forestry, I just thought I'd give a little plug. We now, we just got approved. We have a, a forestry degree program that we're offering at the University of uh, Nebraska-Lincoln. And if you go to trees.unl, there's a bunch of, of things, resources on this website for tree ID and some other things that if you're interested in, and certainly my contact information is there for those that are interested in, in different education opportunities. And yes, I've had students anywhere from 18 to 85 take some of my courses. So we're always happy, even if you're not looking for a new degree and you just want to take a course, that's certainly available. Um, and I, I, I'll try to, I'll look through some questions I didn't get a chance to answer, but for those that want to you email me or just go to the website or if you, if you use Twitter or Instagram and you want to follow along, I, I try to post just tree stuff. I, I don't get into anything else. We just talk about trees, cool information about trees. So if you're interested in that, please, please uh, let me know. And 
Um, if there are any other questions, I'm going to go back to a couple that, that we had here at the beginning and see if I can, can answer them. Uh, there's a question that came in, said, I see lots of swamp oaks around Omaha, but they never look healthy, i.e. Uh, they have some dead limbs. Is this oak more likely to get diseases? Not necessarily, um, but swamp oaks, so soil, uh, pH value of soil can, can impact how well trees do. And Nebraska, a lot of our soils in Nebraska tend to be higher pH, so above seven. And trees, a lot of our trees like to be in that maybe six, six and a half to about 7.2, 7.3. And some of the swamp oaks I've noticed don't do great if they're in really high pH soils, which can make their leaves look kind of yellowish. We call that chlorotic. It means they're not taking up all the nutrients. And that might eventually cause branch death to come in. Um, I wouldn't say that the swamp oak is any more... Uh, more or less likely to get a, a disease that affects oaks than bur oak or than, than some of the others, um, the white oak, um, but it might be something like that. And, and tree diseases and, and tree diagnostics, there's a lot of things that can cause the same thing. So the only way to know for sure would be to look, but I, I would think it's maybe more of a pH or a soil type of, type of thing. Um, let's see. Uh, what's the best practice for cutting off the small suckers at ground level? So sometimes you get a tree, this happens a lot with apples, and this happens a lot with basswoods or lindens. Um, the best way to prevent it, honestly, is to make sure the tree is planted properly when you first go in. If you plant some trees too deep, they automatically send, send up sprouts and suckers because um, in, we see this with uh, some of our trees that grow along riverways that when they get annual flooding, uh, the tree gets partially buried and in order for it to continue to survive, it says, well, I'll just throw up some new sprouts and suckers. So to help prevent this, planting at the proper depth is important. Best way to do it is to just take a nice sharp uh, pruning, uh, hand pruners or if you need a little handsaw, and to just prune those off. Unfortunately, you, you, you might have to do it time over time. Uh, if it gets too severe, those sprouts and suckers can actually girdle the tree themselves and cause damage. So something to look at. Uh, I planted a, so you planted a, a honey locust in April, still doesn't have any leaves. Is that normal? Um, yeah, it depends upon how, how it was when you got it. I'd give it a little bit more. It seems like we've had enough warm days that it should be okay. But if it was completely dormant and cold when you planted it, um, it might take a little bit more time. I wouldn't give up on it until midsummer. Keep it watered for a while. Usually, if you go to the branches and if you you kind of bend them down just a little bit, if they snap, uh, then yes, it's dead. If they bend a little bit, I'd I'd give it a little bit of chance. Honey locust can be a little late to come out, and if you've just planted it in in, in April, it might still be sort of waiting to hit enough warm days. I, I would have expected it to show some signs by now, but don't give up yet. Give it give it a little bit of time. Um, I think there's a couple in the beginning here. Okay, we got the zipper bags. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through a few comments. Um, Yes, you can cor correct uh, roots that are choking uh, it, when they're visible. Um, if you want to do it on a bigger landscape tree, like I said earlier, it can be a little riskier because it's a great big tree and cutting off roots, you might uh, impact its stability. And so, uh, and it can be sort of expensive, but that can be done. Usually though, it's best to correct them right at time of planting. Um, what tree is, okay, too young, oh, good, okay. Oh, okay. If I missed a question, maybe just retype it. I'm just trying to scroll through. Um, I have a tree. The bark is peeling away from the tree, mostly at the base. Do you know what could be the cause of that? Um, the uh, Hard to say. Usually if it's right at the base of the tree, uh, uh, what I've seen and noticed is that it can be a, a uh, 
problem with lawnmower or string trimmers where they actually connect and bounce into the tree. And if you scrape against that, especially when it's young, that can cause some problems. Um, so that's not great. You want to make sure that you're, you're protecting against that. Sorry, one sec. I just got to make sure my laptop is plugged in. All right, sorry about that. Technical. Um, let's see. So <clears throat> there's an elm in my backyard. Several bunches of leaves dropped. Just curious and dissected a leaf. There were what looked like mites. Uh, if they're just mites inside, so especially on some of the elms, they make almost. Um, these like little red structures that come out of them and if you cut them open, yeah, there are insects in there. Those are, if it's just on the leaves, it's fine. Um, if it's actually starting to girdle the twig itself, as long as it's just small twigs, it shouldn't be a big problem. Usually what we look for on trees, if it's a big thing, as you see an entire branch start to die back, then I'd be concerned about that branch falling unpredictably and so you'd wanna make sure it was pruned or checked. Um, So there was a, somebody had made a comment that they had a bur oak, the rabbit uh, was eating and it came up three trees and now I have two but cut off the weakest one last fall. Yeah, that's, a, that's okay to do that. Um, I sometimes let trees go for, especially if they're really small for a couple of years, see which trunk or branch might be the strongest and then prune off the things that I don't like and then maintain it a little bit. How do you keep squirrels from shredding uh, bark on new trees? Uh, I wish I had an answer for that. I feel like I could retire. Um, I, I don't really maybe encourage hawks to be in your neighborhood, plant, plant things for hawks to come in. They like to pick off squirrels. Yeah, it's really hard. As squirrels, especially in the spring, they're, before other stuff has come up, they're peeling away. There's nutrients right under that bark, and they, they are pesky, and I, I don't have a good answer for how to prevent that other than bringing in hawks, I guess. Um, Last tree planted basswood. So uh, I have, I planted a, a linden or a basswood for, for a, a friend of mine and that planted in, it looked like it was doing pretty good, but the above ground trunk died. We don't really know why. And then it, it produced sprouts and suckers at the base. I actually came in and we cut off the dead main trunk and we left one uh, sucker at the base and after five years, that, that new sucker was, was the tree, and you could barely tell, because it was a small enough tree, you could barely tell uh, uh, what had happened. So, um, so, so it would, it's good. If, if it, basswoods haven't leafed out yet, and it's been in the ground for a while, I would say, you know, maybe time to consider what, what you want to do. Basswoods should have all leafed out, especially because we had warm pretty early on. Um, here's another question in the chat. The large 20 year old maple, some roots are on the ground surface. Should I cover them with soil? Can I? Uh, if you cover roots with soil, what they tend to do is just go back up to the new layer of soil. Um, roots are coming near the surface because they need enough oxygen and, and moisture. And by burying them, you're essentially eliminating some of the oxygen, and, and they actually need that. Think about you if, if you were at the bottom of a swimming pool with a, a a cup with a straw in it, you tried to take a drink out of the straw. Don't try that, it would be bad, right? But you need a little bit of oxygen when you try to, to bring in that whatever, whatever water is in that cup. And tree roots need a little bit of oxygen in order to basically respire or grow, and they need a little bit of oxygen in order to absorb some water. And so um, it's hard to fix surface roots, to be quite honest. You can cover them up, but over a period of time, they come back up. Usually what I do is, um, remove the lawn in that area and maybe put some mulch or put some other plants in there that can kind of be in between the roots so you don't have to worry about mowing over them or, or tripping on them and things like that. Um, if you want to make sure that you sort of discourage surface roots in future plantings, loosening the soil. So Nebraska has a lot of fairly heavy clay soils that can be compacted and that can give rise to more uh, surface rooting and so making sure you're, you're making that soil not compacted essentially keeping the soil loose and aerated can, can help. But once they develop, it's really difficult to get rid of them. Um, if you cover them with just a tiny little bit, but if you put much on there, they'll, they'll eventually rise back up to that, that same level. 
What causes galls on trees and are they harmful? Well, it depends on the gall. Uh, so galls are typically uh, produced, uh, interestingly, galls are produced in response to an insect, but they're not produced by the insect. The gall is actually plant tissue that goes over uh, the insect and the insect is basically has a little home. So it has plant food in there and it gets protected and then when it's fully developed, it can fly out. If you see only a handful of galls, especially on leaves, it's not a problem. There's some out right now called oak apple gall and it looks, they're, they're about this big, maybe about the size of a quarter or a little bit bigger. And um, they look like little green apples that are on the underside of, a, of an oak leaf. And that's not a problem at all. The, the leaf still is green, it still photosynthesizes, and the leaf falls off every year anyway, the next year the tree will, will do a new leaf, so not a big, not a big deal. Um, I usually like to tell people, if there are no insects on your trees, nothing's eating your tree, there's nothing growing on your tree, something is wrong. We, <laughs> insects and, and growing and eating on trees is all completely natural and, and, and should be the way it is, and we could tolerate that a little bit more than maybe we do, it shouldn't be, most galls are not a problem. Um, some, there's one called a rough bulleted gall wasp, and that, if they get on the twig, can completely encircle a twig, and if a tree is really stressed out, they will overcome the tree, but usually it's because the tree is already completely stressed out, and the insect is just picking on a tree that's already in decline. So usually it's not the gall, that's the problem, it's the tree stress. Um, there's another question that came in. Oh, uh, somebody just talked about losing their 18-year-old aspen. Yeah, it's uh, aspens and fungus. Uh, aspens in Nebraska are a little, it can be a little touchy. Um, they really like to be where it's really cold up in the, the, you know, through Canada. And so they can be a little touchy here. I know there's a few native populations here, but yeah, they, they can be touch and go. Um, and thank you. Yeah, it was, it's been fun to present to, to everyone. Um, planting, can there be too many roots? Uh, can there be too many roots that should be cut off before planting? Um, I, I wouldn't say so, no. I mean, tree, trees produce roots. Uh, trees will keep themselves in balance. They'll, they have however much foliage, and that foliage actually has, even in firs, right, they, they have chemicals that say, I have this many leaves, I need this much water, and they send a chemical signal, the tree puts on roots, and the roots say, I have this many roots, we're hungry, put on more leaves. And so the tree naturally keeps itself in balance. The only reason to cut off roots is roots is if they're uh, defective or they're encircling the tree. And so we wanna make sure that we remove those. But if you just have a lot of roots, I would say that's usually a better sign that the tree is, is cause then it can lose a few without causing major problems. Too few of roots is usually the, the bigger problem. And, and if they're encircling or they're somehow dysfunctional. All right, so we're a little over six o'clock and I know it's probably dinner time for folks or you wanna get out and enjoy the beautiful day outside. Um, so if there's any last questions, otherwise I thank you all for, for being attentive and, and the kind, kind words that some of you have shared and, and thank you very much.